Hey everyone, this is Kendall from the Recording Lounge Podcast, and on today's video, we're going to be talking about ground loops, what they are, why they exist, and how we can eliminate them in our audio systems. There's a lot of confusion about grounding, power, and isolation, and to be fair, it's a complicated topic. I can't possibly cover every single topic in this video, so instead, I'm mostly going to focus on the basics of ground loops and how to deal with them. So first things first, what is a ground loop? A ground loop is a phenomenon that happens when two or more pieces of interconnected equipment have different paths to ground. More precisely, ground loops are caused by small voltage differences that normally exist between these various ground connections. When a loop is made, current will flow through it, and sometimes in unexpected ways. Long story short, this results in noise being induced into your audio signal, and that's not good. Ground loop noise typically manifests as buzz, hum, loud squealing or interference, crackles, pops, and other kinds of noises. And in some cases, they can be very, very loud. So how do we stop ground loops? Well, simply speaking, we have to break the loop. And this can be done in a few different ways. On paper, we could break the loop here, or here, or even here. But in practice, it's usually safest to break the loop in the audio ground path rather than the power ground path. But we'll talk about that a little bit more later. To help you understand this in the context of an audio rig, let's look at some really common examples. Say you're a bassist and you're running through a DI and an amp for your bass rig. The DI plugs into the snake, the amp plugs into the wall, and suddenly you get this loud buzz. This is because you've created a ground loop. As you can see, your signal flow is now going in two different directions, but they end up forming a loop around the entire system. So how do we fix it? Well, in most direct boxes, there's a switch labeled lift or ground lift or something similar, and this is why that switch exists. When we flip the ground lift switch, it defeats the ground signal on the XLR path. Now, I want to be clear, the XLR is still shielded and grounded at one end. So you're still getting the benefits of shielding and noise rejection. The only difference is that current now can't flow through it as a loop. So this fixes the ground loop problem and your signal chain is clean and clear without noise. Let's look at another common example. Say you're a guitarist and you're splitting your signal between two different amps using a splitter. You can already see it, can't you? That's right, you've created a ground loop. So we have to break that loop. Now yes, technically you could isolate one of the amps using an isolation transformer, so-called technical power, or so-called ground loop isolators, but it's not really the safest method. To quote Bill Whitlock, who is pretty much the authority on all things ground noise related, a loop could be broken by defeating a safety ground, but don't do it. If a fault occurs in the lifted device, the fault current flows through the signal cable to get to the grounded device. It's very likely that the cable will melt and burn. Defeating safety grounding is both dangerous and illegal. The safe way to break the loop is to install a ground isolator somewhere in the audio signal path. So yeah, I don't recommend trying to isolate or lift your guitar amp's ground connection. I only bring it up to help you understand the idea of breaking the loop. In practice, it's much safer and easier to break the loop somewhere in the audio path. So in this example, the way to do it is to use a splitter that has an isolated output, which is often done with a transformer of some kind. This breaks the loop and isolates the two signals from each other, and that kills the noise. The next example is incredibly common, and yet most people don't even realize they may be forming dozens of ground loops in the process, and that's when using pedal boards. So, you're a guitarist with a pedal board and an amp. Seems simple enough, right? Well, not exactly. You can already see one ground loop that you formed. And for the record, it doesn't matter if you plug this into a single outlet or not. The loop is still there. To be clear, plugging everything into one outlet is the ideal way to do it, and it can solve certain noise problems, but it won't magically fix a ground loop. So, we need to break this loop. As I mentioned, you could break it at the amp, but it's not the safest way to do it. You could use an audio isolation transformer at the end of your pedal board, but you might be thinking, wait, I've never had to do that, and I don't know any guitar players who have to do that. That's not a common thing to see, so what gives? 
Well, thankfully, in the pedal world, we have the ability to isolate our pedal power and signal grounds by the use of an isolated and regulated power supply. These are purpose-built to do this. So if you have a power supply like a Strymon or a Voodoo Labs, you've probably never had this problem. It breaks the loop for you. Not only does it break the ground loop in this type of system, but it also breaks the loops between all of your pedals. Check out this graphic from Strymon's website. On a normal daisy-chained or non-isolated pedal power setup, you not only create ground loops between your pedal board and your amp, you also create ground loops between every single pedal. But using an isolated power supply with isolated outputs, you break all of the ground loops. So in summary, get a good power supply for your pedal board. I promise you it will solve a lot of problems, problems you didn't necessarily even know you had. It will regulate the voltage on your pedals, and it makes everything so much easier in a complex signal path. For example, a recording studio or a big live setup. On that note, let's look at a few examples in a studio context. Say you're in the studio and you want to record your guitar going to the amp, but you also want to capture the direct signal. For this example, let's assume that you're using a small bus-powered interface like this. You already see the problem, I'm sure. We've got multiple paths to ground, and again, it doesn't matter if the amp or the computer are on the same outlet. A ground loop still exists. As before, we can use a ground lift switch on the direct box or an isolation transformer in the direct box path. When using unbalanced and balanced signal lines, it's usually better to break the loop in the balance path. You already get a lot of noise rejection benefits from the balance path, so you might as well break the loop there. Now, in many cases, I've found that computers already have pretty well isolated power supplies, so they don't typically have the same problems that audio equipment tends to have. But even if that wasn't the case, in this particular instance, we actually have one more option available to us. We can unplug the laptop from the wall. This breaks the loop and runs the computer off of a completely floating, isolated DC power source, which is its battery. Okay, so one final example. Consider it the final boss. Prepare yourself. While this is a much more complicated setup, it's actually incredibly common for large studios. In this example, we've got our guitar plugged into a pedal board, which has power and ground. Then we have some sort of active guitar preamp or DI or splitter or transmitter box, which is very common for big studios where a guitarist wants to be in the control room, but the amps are out in another room, like a live room or a booth. This box might be something like a radial SGI, an undertone GB tracker, a Little Labs instrument distro, a TA stereo link, or it might be a combination of a few devices like a DI and a radial SGI. It's helpful to make sure you think about each individual path as its own thing. For example, if you use a DI and a radial SGI together, those are two separate paths that need to be considered. Just because they're close by doesn't mean it's one path. In this case, we're capturing the DI signal and transmitting to the other room via XLR. So our transmit device typically outputs some kind of balanced XLR line. We go through the wall or a patch panel or a snake. And on the other end, we'll have some sort of receive box or multiple boxes. These receive boxes convert the signal back into an unbalanced quarter inch line, allowing us to go to our amps. And in this case, we're splitting to two amps. So as you can tell, this setup has many ground paths and you guessed it, it is riddled with ground loops. So the first thing we wanna do is establish our ground reference. And as we've learned, it's not the safest idea to isolate or lift the ground on your amps, especially not tube amps with high voltages and whatnot. So we're going to assume that this outlet is our ground path and we need to try to break the loops around it so we can get back to just one ground path. Now, as I mentioned on the last example, computers and interfaces typically don't have severe ground loop problems between them. I mean, when's the last time you heard about a producer or engineer complaining about 60 cycle hum when using their interface and computer? In my experience, these companies know this is a thing, so they typically design their devices accordingly. So we can cross that one off the list. Now, let's go all the way to the other end of the chain. We've seen this situation before. We're using some kind of splitting system to go to two amps, and we need to isolate the path to one of those amps. In this instance, we have a ground lift switch on our splitting devices, so that solves that loop. 
Now let's go back to the beginning of the chain, back to where our pedal board is. And we know that using a well-isolated and regulated power supply will fix all kinds of problems, not only within the pedal board, but also how it interacts with the entire system. So we're gonna equip the pedal board with a good Strymon power supply and cross it off the list. Moving along the signal path, we're going to use an isolation transformer or a ground lift if it has one on our DI path. This is already a balanced line. It's an easy place to break the loop and there's lots of isolation transformer options out there from companies like Jensen. Now here's where this can get really tricky. Depending on the type of transmit box or combination of boxes or splitting that we're doing for this, it might be tricky to break the loop. If it's a single device and it has a well-designed circuit with good isolation between the power and the circuit blocks, uh, then you're golden. And as you can see, the signal path can now flow freely and you're not creating any loops anywhere. But believe it or not, there are a lot of devices out there that have internal ground loops, poor isolation, and or don't account for the various situations that we might encounter in a studio. We want to be able to hook up gear however we want. That's the ideal case. And I understand it's kind of impossible to design a piece of gear to account for every possible situation. And things get complicated when using multiple devices, especially if all of those devices have power and audio ground. In fact, I've yet to find one perfect device that really accounts for every possible situation in terms of transmitting guitar signals. Take, for example, if instead of a pedal board, we wanted to use a single vintage pedal that had an AC cord, something like this phaser. This presents a problem because if it doesn't have proper isolation, then you're going to have issues. As you can see here, you've developed a ground loop throughout this entire system. Or maybe if your receive box is transformer isolated, but the transmit box is not, then you might be creating a loop here instead. So most likely we're going to have to put some kind of isolation in the path here, or here, or here, or we're gonna have to put the pedals after an isolated receive box. And I can't necessarily tell you which one of these is going to be the quietest for your particular situation because there are so many factors and possibilities that go into this. The point is that you need to look at every single piece of the system and try to trace out the ground paths. It's helpful to literally sketch out a block diagram like this, accounting for every single power and signal path to understand where the loops are forming, and then you can make a plan to start breaking the loops one at a time and quiet down the noise. Take your time, be patient, go one piece of the chain at a time, and isolate the problem. Pun intended? Hopefully this video was helpful to you in understanding the basics of ground loops in audio systems. For more details, I highly recommend you read the many articles published by Bill Whitlock, especially read his paper, Understanding, Finding, and Eliminating Ground Loops, which I've linked in the description. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Uh, check out the podcast on your favorite podcast app and check out recordingloungepodcast.com. On the front page, you'll find a link to our Discord server where you can chat with other nerdy audio people and learn some stuff along the way. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you next time. See ya.